Hello, and thank you for tuning in to this presentation uh, intended to provide a little bit more information about the revenue streams that are used to comprise the school budget. We're going to record this session and post it to our website, at the end of which there'll be some times for questions and answers. We will try to get it posted to the district's webpage, the budget section, just as soon as we can. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen here and begin the presentation. Uh, that is going to look specifically at the revenue sources for the annual school budget. So this is not the overall budget presentation, although I will touch upon some of the elements involved in this year's budget presentation. This is really to focus on the revenues, the monies that come in that comprise the school budget. What, what I hope you get out of this session is we're going to look at all of the, the revenues, the three biggest buckets that come in uh, to comprise the, the, local, the annual school budget. I'm going to explain some elements of state aid. I'm going to review the allowable tax levy calculation, and I'm going to address a couple of other forms of revenue that the district uses, including revenues and revenues from pilot agreements within the community. Uh, as a quick overview, just a reminder, when we create the annual school budget, the Board of Education adopts six principles that we use to guide the decisions that we have to make each year related to the school budget. They, the school budget will annually respond to the needs that are in front of us, that it aligns to resources and goals, that we, if we have to make cuts or create efficiencies, we want to keep those as far away from student learning as people as we can. We want to understand the implications for future budgets, so we don't want to do something one year if we're not going to be able to sustain doing it in future years. As hard as it can be, we want to move forward, so it, it's tough to innovate. Uh, sometimes we have to let go of some things, but we do want to move forward and we want to value the community's input in terms of what they feel about the quality of the education that we're providing and the overall budget process. So every district in the state really uses two primary revenue streams, but there's really three that most schools access on an annual basis. This is a, an overview of school district revenues in New York State, so it's going to have a little bit of a New York State specific flair as, long as, as well as some history and background information. Within New York State, there's three primary buckets um, that get used. There's a New York State school aid. There's the monies that are generated through local tax levy. And then there are a couple of other minor sources of revenue. So we're going to focus exclusively on the revenue side. So where does the money come from? In the budget hearing, we'll address more about the expenditures, although we will touch upon it a little bit in this presentation. So we mentioned the three revenue streams, the, the state aid, the tax levy, and we're going to address the other revenues as well. But I wanted to start with just a, a look at the last couple of years within the school budget. So I know the cursor is going to be kind of small, but if you go back in time to two years ago with the, with the school budget, you can see this item here in blue. This represents the state aid portion of our school budget. So of all the monies that came in, this amount of money came from state aid. It, it represents just about half or 49.4% of the total monies. The local tax share is this section in green here. So you can see that, that these two comprise most of the, the annual budget. On a year-to-year -year basis up until the last couple of years, these two, the state aid and the local tax levy comprised about 96% of the school budget with just under 5% coming from other revenue sources such as pilot agreements or use of reserves. So this was the 2022-23 school year. This middle graph represents the 2023-24 school year, so the year that we're currently in. You can see in this year, this is the first year of full funding from state, from New York State aid calculation. So the full funding formula shows that just over half of the of the monies come from the New York State aid to school. So 51.6% of this year's budget came from state aid with just under 44% coming from the local tax levy. So between those two, again, they comprise the lion's share of the, of the overall revenues with a smaller portion coming from the other revenue sources such as pilots and reserves. As we project into next year, we see something that I find a little bit troubling is that the state aid calculation is going backwards a little bit. So instead of the state 
picking up its first year of full funding. It shows that the funding was slightly more than half of our revenues coming from the state. This proposed proposal for the coming year shows that just less than half per, half of the revenues will come from the state. So a little troubling that the state is stepping backwards in terms of the percentage of funding that it's providing for our school district. The local tax levy is about 42.6% projected for next year. And you can see these other revenue streams are now have moved over the 5% range and are now comprising nearly 7% of the overall budget. So you can see as the state has stepped backwards, we've had to access some different revenue streams. And I'll try to dive into this a little bit more as we go through the presentation. So when I say New York State school aid, there's a number of school aids. There's transportation aid, there's building aid, there's special education aid. There's a number of aids that school that all come together to be one New York State aid. The most important component is what's called foundation aid. That's the, that's the, uh, the foundational amount of resources that needs to be put forward by the state given the state's expectations to provide a sound basic education. So that foundation aid is what we'll talk about the most. And what I also wanna to touch upon is to just kinda of share with people some of the information about how New York State is, has a, un unfortunately um, not a great track record when it comes to, um, to a reputation or a practice, maybe not even a reputation, a practice of equitable funding. New York State is famously uh, challenged to provide equitable funding. This year is the closest we've come, the current year that we're currently in. So you can see in foundation aid, um, so this is a large amount of money. So you can see where Avon lies. These 22 bar graphs represent all of the districts in the Genesee Valley BOCES. And each one of them gets a foundation aid allotment from New York State. And you can see Avon is down here, third lowest in terms of the number of students we have in the amount of foundation aid provided from the state of New York. So we're, in terms of districts, only two in our region receive less money per student than we do here at Avon. And that's, unfortunately, that's been a trend, uh, a long-standing pattern that, new, that Avon has been underfunded by New York State. So this is quite a bit of, of uh, a difference between those that are the most funded and where we find ourselves at just under $10,000, with some schools being at $15,000, approaching $15,000 over here to the right, or even approaching $20,000 at the far right of the graph. This is not to, to disparage or disrespect our, our colleagues in the Genesee Valley BOCES. Instead, it's just to provide a snapshot of where we stand in terms of the total revenues that come into the district. I mentioned New York State's history of inequitable funding. This goes back to a lawsuit that was started in 1993 by a group, the Campaign for Fiscal Equity. They first filed the lawsuit in 1993. Then in 2007, it was finally settled that a solution needed to be put in place. The solution was adopted. The, the solution was a new foundation aid formula that would drive more funds to schools on an equitable, equitable basis, and it was going to be phased in over four years. Um, it was paused. There was a, there was a pretty significant recession in around 2008, 9, 10, and the state took a while to get back on its feet. So the four-year implementation period was never met. And as a result, it went, we continued to go underfunding, and I have a graph later that'll underfunded, and I have a graph later that'll explain some of that. This current year is the first year of full funding. So 31 years after the initial lawsuit was the first year that New York State fully funded its own foundation aid formula to provide a sound basic education in New York. This year and before this year ended, the, there were changes and adjustments made to the foundation aid formula by the governor and her budget office. And these were done without a lot of conversation from the field. None of us, in fact, expected that they were that were they were going to come. So the formula now calculates slightly less money for Avon, but it's been tinkered with in non-transparent ways. However, the final budget will give us the same amount of aid for 24-25 as we have this year. So we're not losing any funding in the end but we're also not going up when we know we're facing a 4.1% consumer price index. Makes it challenging to build a school budget. 
I mentioned the, the history of inequitable funding from New York State. So going back to the 078, when the formula needed to be fixed and there was supposed to be this four year phase in period, what these bar graphs show is the monies that we were supposed to see receive, the total amount isn't shown, but that would be the top of the graph. With the graphs coming below, that is all of the funds in each of these years that we did not receive. New York State's formula was, was calculated, the formula was run for Avon, and then we did not get this amount of money on each of these years. So as you move farther to the right, it gets a little bit better. And you can see in 23, 24, this current year, there is no deficit. We have no deficit this year because it's the first and only year that the foundation aid formula was fully funded. In total, up until this point, we've lost or not been funded about $24 million that New York State's own formula calculates for the Avon State, for the Avon School District. $24 million is approximately our school budget for one year and it's the state's portion of our school budget for nearly two years. You can see in 24, 25, we're showing a little bit of a deficit. This is, I, I need to uh, explain this a little bit. So in all of these years where we were underfunded, roughly um, half of the districts in our region were being overfunded by various amounts. So as we were not getting the standard amount, some districts local and across the state were actually getting more than what the formula was calculating. So instead of taking monies from these folks, as Robin Hood might have done, to balance the formula, to balance the resources earlier, New York State just kept it going. And when we were bringing up the standard over the last two years, those districts that were already overfunded were being given 3% due minimum. So a recognition that some of the costs are going up, that some additional resources are needed from the state. So they got not only above their formula foundation aid a calculation, but 3% on top of that. So one would think that without any conversation in November, December, that this same pattern might apply to the coming school year, but that switch, the, the, the aid was, um, the foundation aid formula was changed and we're working very hard to try to advocate for a strong and purposeful look at what that foundation aid formula calculates and what does it truly cost to educate a student in New York State in 2025. Uh, but right now we have to live with a tinkered formula. However, I'm counting that while other districts for all of these years got 3% guaranteed every year, the first year we're fully funded, Avon once again just is held even and does not get any 3%. So I, I would consider that a approximate 3% of a reduction in our aid or about $330,000 is what 3% would have been had we received the due minimum like all of our own overfunded colleagues have received. So pretty substantial here. That's why there's this asterisk and I'm calling this out. Um, so I just, I wanna make sure that I'm trying to be clear about the history here of resources that New York State itself calculated. New York State itself said Avon should get to provide an education in New York State and then we did not receive those funds. We're not alone. This happened across the state. It's roughly half the districts being overfunded, half being underfunded, and the amounts vary. Within our region, Avon is among the most underfunded of our 22 schools, of those who have traditionally been underfunded. So that, that's a quick overview of the state aid and the history of state aid and the history of inequitable funding from New York State. And now I wanna switch to a, the second source uh, or revenue stream for schools, which is largely the tax levy. And in 2012, then Governor Cuomo started requiring school districts based on a formula that the state established to calculate and report an allowable tax levy. So it was referred to as a 2% tax cap. That's not really an accurate statement. There's one factor within the formula that cannot go higher than 2% but the, the entire calculation itself is an allowable tax levy, and it can be over 2%. The implications are whenever you apply a levy that is greater than the allowable levy calculated, then a supermajority is needed for the vote from the voters. Um, anything up to the allowable levy calculation can be passed with a simple majority. So there's the terms allowable levy and the actual levy. Uh, levy. So school districts can uh, have an allowable levy that's up here, and propose an actual levy that is below that. If they do that, then that can move forward simply with 
a 50% voter approval. If the allowable levy calculation is here and the district wants to pursue greater amount of taxes, then a supermajority is needed where 60% of the vote would have to be in favor of that. I can tell you that since this started in 2012, the Avon Central School District has never pursued a, a, a levy that is above the allowable calculation. In fact, out of the 13 years, we've been below the allowable levy calculation about six times. So I want to take you into our levy history a little bit. But first, just a quick overview of what the levy actually is. The levy itself is really just a total amount of money that's collected and then divided amongst of the properties and the property owners. So the levy itself, when we refer to the levy going up, it's, a, it's in reference to that total amount of money. So if there is hypothetically $100 worth of levy and the allowable levy and, and the district pursued a 2% raise, then you could, then that total amount of money collected through taxes can only go to a $102 amount. So you can see from this example, this is a fictional example, there's this pizza pie on the left-hand side with an, a levy of about 2.5%. That means the total pizza pie can only get about 2.5% bigger. And you can't detect it here, but the pie on the right is actually 2.5% bigger, but it's in reference to all of the total monies that are collected through taxes. Uh, diving into the, the more specific history of Avon, Again, we have the allowable levy, so that's a calculation that we have to calculate each year from a formula and report it to New York State. And then there's the actual levy, so what we were would be allowed to go out and get with a 50% majority and what the district has actually pursued. So you can see, going back through the years, 2019-20, uh, the district went out at the calculated levy limit. 2020-21, we were below the levy limit. limit. 21, 22 at the levy limit, 22, 23, about half of the allowable levy limit, 23, 24, significantly below the allowable levy limit. This is, so coming into this year, remember, is the first year that New York State fully funded Avon. So when New York State fully funded, the district could consider some additional tax benefits to the community. What we're proposing next year is the allowable levy limit calculation is 4.21%. And instead to balance the budget for next year, we're recommending an actual levy of 3.39%. So again, below the allowable levy limit. The third source of, of revenue streams for the district come from these other two primary, they're called pilot or pilot agreements. And that stands for payments in lieu of taxes or district reserves. We'll take these apart and look at both of them, remembering that these take up about six to 7% of the total school budget. So pilots are an economic development tool. They, uh, they vary in the terms of their duration, like how long the pilots are. And they also vary in terms of, of the agencies that are involved with the pilot agreement, what percentage each of those agencies get. So for example, a, a pilot agreement in our community might have uh, a portion of the pilot being paid to the county, to the town of Avon, to the village of Avon, and to the school district. How much each of those entities get is something that varies by agreement, and how long the agreement is in place also varies by agreement. These revenues are excluded from what we call the levy from before, and it gets really complicated, uh, so I'm going to do my best to explain a complicated uh, example. So hypothetically, these are this is a fictional town and this is a fi fictional example. Everything in here is grossly exaggerated simply to try to, to provide a, a talking point. So here we have this industry that enters a pilot agreement. So this industry, it, it's just wanting to get started. So instead of uh, starting the business, having all those startup costs and, and paying taxes at that point, entities involved agree to a payment in lieu of taxes. They, they all agree that the the business, while it's starting up, will pay $5,000 a year to the various entities in the school district will get $5,000. I mean, let me clarify that. They pay more than $5,000, but the school district's portion is $5,000. Also in this fictional community, we have these 10 identical homes. Each of these identical homes is assessed at $175,000, and all of these homes in this fictional community pay $5,000 in school tax on their home. 
So the total property wealth, because this business is outside of the taxable property wealth at this point, is just related to these homes at $1.75 million is the total property wealth. And the total amount collected in taxes is $50,000 with each of the 10 homes paying $5,000. The total revenue that goes to the district as the money is coming in would be 55 total thousand dollars. 5,000 from this agreed upon pilot and 50,000 from these local taxes. This is an example of a business that is on a pilot, how it might work in a really, really simplified version. If we look at when this business comes off of the pilot, so in the year it moves off of the pilot, it's gonna be a little bit more complicated. So as it's coming off of the pilot, it receives a, a, an assessment of $400,000. So instead of in a, pi a simple pilot payment agreement, there's actually an assessment of property that must be considered. The total revenue is gonna stay at $55,000, but it's gonna start getting divided a little bit differently. Again, we have each of these homes assessed at $175,000. So the total property wealth has to be calculated. So the total property wealth is the sum of all of these home values, plus the value of this business now that is on the tax levy. So the 175,000 times 10 is 1.75 million plus the 400,000 gives us a total property value of $2,150,000. Of that total property value, the business is 400,000, so they represent about 18.6% of the total property value, and the homes represent 81.4%. So we go back to this $55,000 total revenue that comes in, and we divide it according to the percentages. So the $55,000 times the 18.6% means that the business now has to pay $10,230 in for its tax levy. So of the total 55,000, 18.6% to be exact is coming from the business. The rest of this now the, of the four, of the 55,000, what remains is $44,770. That's the, there's a typo there. It's $44,770. When you divide that evenly amongst the evenly devalued homes, then the total for each of those property owners is $4,478. So when there's not a pilot in place, it's simply the total property value summed up the, the basic revenue that needs to come from all of those properties, then divided to the proportion of the total value that each property represents. So this is a really simple version. That's, uh, it, it's, it's fictional, like so I want I want to make sure I'm clear about that. It's, it's fictional. Um, but you can see where it get very complicated with multiple pilots coming into the mix, multiple pilots coming off of the mix, those pilots being of different durations, those pilots being of different values and, and percentages. They're going, to they're going to cause some wrinkles that need to be ironed on a year-to-year -year basis. Then add in our, home, our homes in the community are not perfectly even in terms of assessed value. There could be weather disasters that might infect, affect the, the, the property value. There might be uh, home improvements that affect the property value. And then different lands, whether business, agricultural, homes, can be taxed at different rates. And then add in different municipalities, even though they may be within a school district, might be taxing at slightly different rates also. So it gets pretty complicated. Um, but the, the nature of this really simple example is just to show that when, when a business is on a pilot and when it comes off of a pilot, that they will have an impact in the total property wealth and how the total levy then, remember the total levy is these pizza pies back here, how this total property levy gets divided up amongst all the property owners. I know that's really complicated, probably tough to just sit and listen to on an example like this. So please feel free to give me a call or give our business office a call and we'll try to go through that with you as best we can. Lastly, I wanna take a look at reserves. So again, this is part of that, that third source of revenues. Reserves for school districts, they come in a couple of different ways. Uh, they come as restricted reserves and unrestricted reserves. A re example of a restricted reserve might be a capital uh, building reserve. When it's a res restricted reserve, the school district needs to get permission from the voters in order to set up, in, for lack of a better word, to set up the reserve itself. So in order to get permission, we have to communicate the purpose. We have to 
get approval via the annual vote uh, for the for the reserve itself. We have to articulate what the maximum amount will be. We have to talk about the duration, how long monies can be contributed to those uh, reserves. And we cannot spend a dime out of those reserves if the funds are put in without coming back to the community and also getting approval. So restricted reserves are a mechanism for, for school districts to do help with some of the long-term planning of the districts, be able to smooth some of the ups and downs of revenues. As I've shown, the state can be an unpredictable partner. So having some access to reserves helps us to do long-term planning, especially around capital assets like buildings and uh, vehicles, school buses, for example, technology and equipment, uh, school furniture, a number of items that are larger uh, expensive items. An unrestricted reserve is a little less um, regulated, but it still has to be very transparent. The purpose of the reserve has to be clearly stated and it, any sort of um, utilization of that reserve must be communicated via school budget, excuse me, school agendas and action must be taken in transparent ways. So the Board of Education is authorized to take action to, to expend the funds or to transfer funds, but they, they can't just simply do that without making it part of a Board of Education agenda and taking official action via resolution. So in summary, as we look at planning for next year, the total revenues for the district are $25,543,894. If we take a closer look at the real property tax, there would be about ten million eight hundred eighty-one thousand would come from the property le property tax levy. That's at a rate of three point three nine percent. Again, that is below the allowable calculation rate of four point two one percent. State aid, um, I mentioned foundation aid remaining flat, so it's the foundation aid that remains flat. The total state aid actually has gone up, but that's because some of those other expense-based aids, such as excuse me, transportation aid, such as building aid, special education aid, things of that sort, function slightly differently than the foundation aid, which is just one component of New York State aid. You can see here an example of pilots um, and interest earning. I didn't touch upon that very much, um, but the pilot agreements and the reserves, um, those funds come into the budget. The reserves themselves, they can accrue interest while they're in the reserve um, uh, in the reserve account. The market has done well over the last year because of the new pilots coming in and some interest developed on the reserves. You can see the total amount of reserves coming in has grown. The appropriated fund balance is going from $300,000 to $470,000. That is because we have to expend some additional funds coming in the coming year to meet the mandate to address our name and imagery. So all of these funds together get us about $521,771 below the amount of money that we need. So in order to close that gap, we plan to make use of some of the unrestricted reserves. Uh, we will be utilizing debt service and we will be utilizing retirement reserves to, to reach a balanced school budget uh, in total. So. I'm not going to go into the expenditures. That's something really a bit more for the overall budget hearing, which will take place on the 13th at 7 o'clock. But just a high-level overview, looking at the salaries, benefits, health insurance, BOCES, debt service, and other contracts would be the buckets where the money gets spent. And then if we think about every dollar that the district spends, here's an approximate breakdown of where those monies go. So about 46 cents of every dollar goes to salaries. Uh, that would be all of the employees from, from teacher aides to the superintendent, to the classroom teachers, to our uh, secretaries in the offices. About, point, about nine cents would go to benefits. Health insurance itself would be 12 cents. Uh, expended on a BOCES program or BOCES service would be about 10 cents on the dollar. Debt service itself would be about eight cents on the dollar. And other contracted supplies is about 15 cents on the dollar. Um, just as a snapshot comparison on the expenditures for the last year that the monies are available, I mean, the, uh, the totals are available, 22, 23. You can see that Avon's per pupil expenditure is just below 25,000 or the most efficient within the BOCES region. So you know, there's different ways to look at this and I know that different people look at it. Um, 
through different lenses. You know, the one that I think holds a lot of value is if, if the educational uh, programming is quality and the expenses are fairly low, then there's definitely good value that's taking place within the community and within the school district. So the, the dollars are being spent efficiently is a way to look at that. I do want to touch upon there will be five propositions on the school budget this year. The first is the, the overall spending proposition. The next is an annual um, vote proposition to be able to purchase two school buses to as part of our vehicle rec vehicle replacement cycle, our uh, school keep our fleet fresh. There's a vehicle and equipment reserve. Uh, we're proposing $375,000 from the vehicle and equipment reserve. More details about that will be in the budget newsletter and in, addressed in the budget hearing. And then we're also asking for, I mentioned those capital reserves, we're asking for permission to establish a school bus reserve at a maximum of $5 million, and that would be a 10-year duration. Uh, the reason we're asking for this particular reserve is schools are currently facing a mandate that in the 27-28 school year that we are required to begin purchasing zero emission school buses as the law is currently written from New York State right now. And by 2035, we're supposed to have our entire fleet transitioned to zero emission school buses. Uh, we are in the midst of a study uh, trying to understand the full implications for infrastructure, for staffing, for uh, purchases, about for charging, for you know, the, the power supply, both within the district, but also from the grid. Uh, we're in the midst of studying all of that. And it's really a, uh, an evolving landscape. There's not a lot of clear path right now. So in working with a long-term financial planner, uh, we feel the most prudent thing we can do is if we're able to, at the end of school years in the next couple of years, set aside some funds in order to better prepare for the purchases of school buses that are gonna cost at least uh, two times the, the cost of the current school buses. So that's, a, that's it in a nutshell about why we're seeking permission to start that reserve. So they can't be started without voter approval. Monies can be in, but none of the money could be spent from that um, particular capital reserve without coming back to the voters at a later time and seeking that permission. And then the last proposition is a proposition on behalf of the Avon Free Library. They're seeking to uh, for the school to be able to uh, host, the, host the vote and then if approved, levy a tax of $170,000 up from $143,000 and that would simply be turned over to the library for its programming. It's an excellent public library. So um, hopefully the, the community will educate itself about the full impact of, of that reserve and proposition. So the Board of Education uh, will also be have one um, seat up. It's a one seat currently occupied by Beth Peck. It is coming up for a three-year term and that, that term will expire on June 30th, 2027. And a reminder that the annual vote is taking place in the middle school auditorium on May 21st, 2024. The time start of the vote was shifted from 12 o'clock to one o'clock for this particular year. I wanted to make sure that we highlight that. It will again close at 9 p.m., but we're delaying the start by one hour, um, but it'll still close at 9 p.m. Please get out and vote. And if there are any questions or and if anybody would like to know a little bit more, please reach out to myself or to our business official, Kristen Murphy, and we will be happy to answer as many questions as we can as quickly as we can. With that, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to go through the presentation. Uh, I hope you found it helpful. And if you have any questions, please reach out. Have a great evening.